picture this, 2005. I finally got to get my dream car. Ford Mustang, 40th anniversary edition, sports car. Three weeks later, I'm driving around town, got the window down, got my elbow out the door, thinking I'm pretty fly. <laughs> out with a friend, we decide, like any good Newfoundlander, that we're going to go get a double-double at 10.30 at night. <laughs> so we pull up uh, in the back alley by Tim Hortons. I noticed this guy walk in front of my car. I'm thinking, he's a little close, but no big deal. Next thing I know, the car door opens, and this guy jumps on me. And he shouts, drive, I got a needle. And I'm thinking, oh my God. And I, all I remember is I covered my head like this. And I was thinking, I'm going to get AIDS. I'm going to get HIV. I'm going to get hep C. Next thing I know, I hear a loud bang. We get in a head-on collision. Somehow, my friend who's in the car with me gets hauled out of the car. And I'm left in my car with this guy kind of throwing punches at me waving the needle around, all this sort of stuff. Somehow, I get hauled out, and I end up on the ground, on the asphalt. I'm looking around me, and all I can see are blocks of cheese. I'm thinking, okay, like, what is going on? Am I hallucinating here? <laughs> there's marble, there's cheddar, there's mozzarella. So we found out later that this guy had robbed Sobeys. <laughs> For cheese. And he was an Oxycontin addict, and he was going to sell this cheese to these local pizza places. I'd like to know their names. And he was selling it so he could go and get his next fix. This is really clever when you think of it. In any event, I don't know if it was then, but I decided, you know what, I should study addictions. This stuff's pretty cool. <laughs> so a few months later, I enter a, uh, I do my master's in counseling psychology, focusing on addictions. I'm currently doing my PhD uh, at Memorial Newfoundland, uh, faculty in medicine, focusing on um, addictions in the community health and humanities faculty. One of the first things you learn when you study addictions, is you learn techniques to help stop an addict from using. So you learn about things like decisional balance, you learn about interventions, you learn about rock bottom, you learn about NA, AA, and all this, this good stuff. But at the end of the day, we still have a 95% failure rate for addiction recovery. So what's going on here? Plato said that the greatest mistake in the treatment of disease is that there are physicians for the soul, uh, physicians for the body and physicians for the soul, although the two cannot be separated. And this is kind of a theme that we're learning in community health, and we try to not to treat just the disease, we try to treat the whole person. So, um, I'd like to ask the audience a question. How many of you guys have ever tried beer? How many of you guys have ever had some wine? How many of you guys have ever had a prescription drug at some time? But how many of you would consider yourself a drug addict or an alcoholic? Statistically, very few of you would. After I had my daughter, which was by far the worst labor and delivery in the history of Newfoundland Labrador, <laughs> I was prescribed Adisol 30s, which is codeine, pain reliever. Took a couple, kind of forgot about them, just threw them out last week, uh, practically a full bottle. So what's going on? What makes me different from the person in the next bed who might still be struggling to get off? I will say that surely addiction is not a choice. No one wants to be an addict. Believe me when I say that. The addicts I work with have lost everything. They lost their homes, their families, their friends, their health, their dignity. I work with a lot of female patients who end up losing their kids. And part of their conditions of getting their children back is that they abstain from drug use, and, and they can't. And as a mother, I can't understand anything being stronger than the maternal bond. So anyways, we look to the brain. So we know the brain develops very rapidly in the first three years, and that we're born, our brains aren't completely developed. The first three years are critical for brain development. So anything that happens during those three years is very, very important. 
can greatly affect the brain. Research shows that brain circuitry and chemistry reflect individual life experience. Brain scans of a person who has experienced childhood trauma show an altered brain. So you might want to ask, what is childhood trauma? Childhood trauma can be defined as many things. Um, can be defined as um, the death of a parent, uh, loss of a sibling, um, a divorce, growing up in a war-torn country. My clients typically uh, have had physical or sexual abuse. New brain scanning technologies are now revealing that the part of the brain that processes physical pain also deals with emotional pain. So we have the secondary somatosensory cortex and the dorsal posterior insula. One deals with emotion, one deals with pain. These can actually overlap. This is what we're showing now. So if I'm on Adisol 30s for pain, it, will, it would be treated by the secondary soma, somatosensory cortex. But the person who has emotional pain can also feel relief. So if we know that someone can be predisposed to addictions because they've, they're, they've been subject to childhood trauma, the question we have to ask ourselves is, why do we treat addicts the way we do? We know trauma causes lifelong suffering. And we really can't blame the victim if they had some sort of adverse childhood experience. Um, there's a, uh, a doctor in Vancouver named Dr. Gabor Maté. And he says, instead of asking why the addiction, we should be asking why the pain. We don't tend to do that very much. Unfortunately, the only treatment many of my clients end up getting is this one here at HMP. I'm not advocating that people do not take responsibility for their actions. Quite the contrary, I think this is crucial in treating addictions. But I think we can do better. I think we need increased resident, residential treatment. We need more harm reduction strategies. We need safe housing. At the very least, we need to stop putting billions of dollars into building more prisons when we're cutting back on social programs. All in the name of the war on drugs. <laughs> Which is really, uh, we call it a war on drugs. It's 100% a war on people and a war on victims. Martin H. Fisher said, 10 cents worth of human understanding equals $10 worth of medical science. And I think that's so true. Overcoming adversity involves working as a community. We need to understand where adversity comes from. We need to understand why someone had this adversity. And we need to be a little bit smarter about what we do about it. In the long run, I hope at the very least, we become a little more compassionate. Thank you. <laughs>